because I do do so much in terms of teaching and designing, people say to me, how on earth do you do everything? And I say, well, you haven't seen my garden and you haven't seen my allotment. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't Google hairy bells anymore because all sorts of things come up. <laughs> um, I've tried. I mean, yeah. This is talking dirty, Annie. <laughs> well, well, don't Google that either. So, I mean, you know, um, so, um, Albolia latifolia, which is a fantastic climber, evergreen climber. I won't tell you what architectural plants, how they describe the fruit. You have to read it in the catalogue because <laughs> that really is talking dirty. Welcome to episode 83 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Rustonall Vicarage, looking particularly suave today, we have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. Well, after days and days of sunshine, we have got a little bit of cloud cover here. What's the weather like in Cambridgeshire, where we will be joining Lord <laughs> Sophia Maria? I've said it the wrong way around, but never mind, you know who you are. Fredrickson, looking stunningly smiley as ever. In check. It is a dull day, um, but that's fine. It's fine. I'm sure the sun will return. We've all got loads of watering to do. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know when it's ever going to rain again, but one day that's I'm sure. That's the thing. The wicked combination at this time of the year is sun and wind. And we have oh. it, we've had it several years running in now where we get this instead of April showers, which you used to get when I was a kid, now we get April drought. Yes. Yeah, so, well, you know, shout out to all the people watering their plants, uh, which I'm sure includes our guest, Tom Atwood. We are delighted. Sadly, not in the greenhouse. We tried this in the greenhouse. It hasn't worked, but that's fine. Tom Atwood of Abby and Tom's Garden Plants. Welcome to Talking Dirty. Well, thanks for asking me. Do you have any middle names? Me? Oh, George. Oh, solid name. <laughs> <laughs> Did any of them come from anywhere? You know, grandparents or... Uh, um, 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 I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I needed a better answer to that, didn't I? Yeah. You need to go and do some family research. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, we'll focus on something that you definitely can answer. Um, I mean, people will be aware of you. I mean, we see your face in Gardens Illustrated and the like. Obviously, you write articles, you kind of lead tours and things, and you have your wonderful nursery and, and plant centre. What's your kind of backstory? When did your love of horticulture begin? Um, well, it's, it sort of started, I think, well, I kind of know exactly when it started. It was when I was in my sort of early teens, and um, we lived abroad a lot as kids because my dad used to be in the foreign office. So we'd often spend 18 months in one country, move on to another, et cetera, et cetera. And it was only about the age of when we were about 12, we sort of settled down somewhere, which was at the time was in uh, North Cumbria. And my parents had bought a, a pretty much a new house that had a, an acre field on the side of it. And it had never been touched. It had been grazed by sheep, but a little else. And my parents, my mum particularly was, really keen to try and do and create some sort of garden space. Wasn't quite sure what to do. Um, and my dad was still abroad a lot, quite uh, a lot of the time. And I was really, I suppose it started off as just lending a hand, getting stuck in. And um, I just got a real bug for it. I, I just loved, and still is the case, it's, it's being outside. I just adore being outside. And at the same time, about 12, 13, you also want a bit of money in your pocket. So the local nursery that my mum would frequent on a weekly basis, spending all our child, all her child allowance uh, <laughs> money went on plants. Um, <laughs> this is why we had no clothes. And, <laughs> and uh, we were at the nursery one day and, and uh, I just said, oh, would you ask them, you know, ask them I've got any, any holiday work? And um, they said, yeah, okay, come do, try do two, two days a week. And this was a really old school market garden that had evolved into, a, into somewhere that grew perennials in about the 80s. Uh, everyone who worked there smoked a pipe. Um, uh, all the compost was mixed in wooden barrows. And there was this constant grey fog in the potting shed from all the tobacco smoke. So God knows what it's done to me. Um, <laughs> But, but fundamentally, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was the simple act of, of just producing the plants on a, on a very sort of, um, certainly not industrialised process. It was quite small batches of things. Um, and it was certainly of its time. They grew a lot of plants that we don't grow now, like lots of small conifers and shrubs, etc. 
Um, but I was just working alongside one of the one of the brothers there who'd been there all his working life, and he just turned to me one day and he said, "Have you ever thought about this as a job, as a career?" And um, I was probably about fifteen at the time, and it kind of you know got got you think, thinking, "Well, okay, maybe this is something I'd lo- I'd be interested in." And and really, sort of from that point on, I continued. And to help my my mum particularly sort of develop the garden, which wasn't easy because it was really thick, heavy clay and pretty bleak spot. Um, But as I sort of progressed through school, I got into conservation or being outside, planting trees. And, you know, you have to start making some decisions when you're 16, 17. What am I going to do with my life kind of thing? And um, I started, I, I... I think one of the key points is I went and did some work experience for a week at Three Gardens in Castle Douglas, which is part of the National Trust for Scotland. And uh, they've got a, a school there where they have a few students um, who go and spend a whole, a whole year there working in the gardens. And I tagged along with them, met the head gardener who it was quite, I was quite intimidated because I was only 16, 17 and everyone <laughs> really knew their stuff. And I was successfully doing things not perhaps the correct way, but they could see that I was enthusiastic. And to cut a long story short from that point, I then they said, well, go and speak to the Botanic Gardens if you're interested in studying further. So I went to Edinburgh. I was very excited to go up there. And um, they offered me a place after school to do a two-year course. And at the same time, I was also heard about Q and... I went down and Q, even more excited. Um, <laughs> and essentially the, the Q said, yeah, we'll offer you a place when you're 20, but you need to have two years of study under your belt. And that was where Edinburgh came in. So I did two years there and then that got me to, to, to Q. But it was, it, was, it was brilliant. And um, uh, my, my, my fellow peers who I went to school with, completely perplexed, didn't have a clue what I was doing and still don't, frankly. Um, and... <laughs> Yeah, so I, I feel, you know, I, I feel fortunate that I've, I've at least had the chance to, you know, get in quite early with what I wanted to do. Yeah, and what I mean, a great pedigree as well. What an amazing string of, of places, you know, Botan- Edinburgh Botanic Garden and Kew. And I know you've held head gardener positions, you know, yeah. since then, yeah. before yeah. you ended up with your, your plant yeah. centre. Yeah. yeah, I think, but quite humble beginnings. It was like the basic stuff that really got me hooked and, and um uh, I mean, the Botanic Gardens are fantastic. They're, they're the most amazing place to sort of, you know, immerse yourself with with plants of every ilk. But actually, you know, they're not necessarily the best places to go and learn how to be a gardener because um, everywhere has its pros and cons. And I think it was that fundamental, it was the gardening that really grabbed me um, and everything else was just helped create layers of interest, I suppose, but yeah. This acre your your mum was turning into a garden, did you get any particular bit of it or were you just a team on the whole acre? Uh, no, well, we'd, we had our own designated space, which ironically was a, a, a miniature conifer garden. And um, I, I, uh, I'm I not a fan of miniature conifers today. <laughs> Maybe I've just turned into a complete snob, but... Uh, <laughs> But no, it was great because we had our, you know, we had our dedicated space and uh, which included sort of um, uh, interesting concrete animals, you know, dotted, dotted throughout it. Um, uh, I think the, place, the taste council would be rolling in their grave right now. But um, Guns but we, Illustrated would not be featuring that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it if they did. <laughs> um, I think it's admirable because we've all got to start somewhere. I mean, I, I suppose I started with a, a boyish collection of cacti. Mm. Um, and then I went, um, I think this is probably partly due to my grandmother, who loves zonal pelagoniums, which she called geraniums. So mm. then went on to a collection of those. And we used to go, when we used to go on holiday to the coast of Norfolk, we used to drive past um, a row of bungalows I suppose they were and there's geraniums for sale was outside and I made father stop the car and I used to go in and buy a geranium for one and sixpence I mean <laughs> seven and a half p if you want to know <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, to add to the collection so you know and as you say you do things in the not in the best possible taste I suppose. <laughs> but it's all part of formulating who you are isn't it yeah definitely definitely and, and I think if you it's those key people, I think, certainly I've experienced, who I've met, who have 
you know, if they've just encouraged you or spurred you on or inspired you, or you thought, or you looked at them and thought, I really like what, I love your job. You know, I'd love to have half of that, you know, somehow. And mm. um, but I, th- I think, I think, you know, and we all know this in, 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 in the world we exist in, that the gardening world is just full of so many kind and generous people. There's some very yeah. eccentric, slightly unusual people as well, but, but, but um, on the whole, people really want to help you, I think, if, if, and, and share, you know, share the knowledge, share knowledge, share plants, if, you know, or whatever. And, and that, I think that for both of us is part of the appeal. You know, you're just surrounded by just really kind, mm. generous people. Yeah. You know? do, you, do you get called up sometimes, Tom, by somebody who says, I've got a whole bed of horses here. I'm fed up with them. I'm going to dump them all. You come and dig them up. You can have them. <laughs> but once a week <laughs> um uh and and i always say do you, you know and quite uh, and what kills that conversation say i don't know what any of them are <laughs> yeah, exactly. kind of running a nursery is a bit tricky you know um, <laughs> i uh, when uh, a few years ago I, I i did some part-time lecturing um to some students up at um penrith Sadly, no longer uh, there was a horticultural college there that regressively has just closed down. Um, but one of the students I taught, a really lovely guy, John, who was, um, I'd say, you know, the more eccentric end of the spectrum. And he lived in a very, really quite a small house. And his obsession was rhododendrons and propagating them. He would just do it, you know, relentlessly with no sort of no worry about where they were going to go or what he's going to do with them. And uh, he, ca- he called me a few years ago to say, Tom, I've got a bit of a problem. Um, I, I need to move house and <laughs> the garden's even smaller <laughs> uh, where we're going to. And I've got this, you know, enormous, well, pretty sizable collection of rhododendrons. And I didn't have the heart to say, because, you know, where else was he going to take them? And I didn't have the heart to say, I'm sorry, John, I can't do it. So I sort of took on board this collection of amazing rhododendrons, but I don't know what any of them are because he, there were no names of anything. Um, it had loads of labels in them, but they were so faded and washed away. So um, I've kind of got them dotted around the place and they look glorious when they do what they do. And I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on roadies. Um, but uh, um, it, it's quite interesting, though, for, to just to even open people's eyes to the, the variation and, you know, some of the lovely larger leaf um, species and mm. cultivars. And um, people say, what's that? And you, you tell them it's a rhododendron and they don't believe you at first. You know? <laughs> um, so uh, I, I do sometimes say yes. And, um, you know, but... Uh, um... Well, it's funny, isn't it? From, from you know, talking about miniature conifers to zonal pelagoniums to mm-hmm. uh, all of your rhododendrons, we've managed to sort of hit upon time and time again some some plants that are not necessarily the most appreciated yeah, of, yeah. The, of the plant groups. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm. Um, uh, it's quite. I mean, in the in the Lake District, you drive round, uh, you know, the larger gardens, and you know, sort of, there's a sort of a fifty fifty chance that what you look at in flower is probably going to be a rhododendron or um, or an azalea or something, and then the the plant next to it is likely to be an enormous Japanese maple because they love, you know, they just love the climate here, and a lot of people. Initially, they'll sort of poo-poo the idea of rhododendrons um, because I think they don't perhaps are not exposed to the amazing variety that is out there. And it's that it's that age-old frustration I have. You go to like the, the larger um, garden centres and you just see the same old, same old, same old. And, and yeah, they're know, all dumpy. They're all dumpy dollops with dull foliage, and they've they're, and, and there's yeah. wonderful flower for about two or three weeks a year. Yeah. But they have they don't what they don't see is what you see where you are in Cumbria mm. and that is the most wonderful cinnamon colored trunks and uh, the lovely yeah. old shapes that these these yeah. these rhododendrons make I mean they're not all squat little bushes yeah I think the Yakushima hybrids that were bred mm. for small gardens are largely to thank for that yeah yes yeah. I mean they're completely characterless as plants I, this is something that's happened to me and more and more as I've got older and older and that is I mean take regal pelagoniums this time not zonals yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you take regal pelagoniums they are shrubby plants and if you see them in South Africa they are they've got these gnarled old trunky sort of stems and things and I like to grow some of mine I've got some in the orange that are like that in actual fact one that's called um Babylon I mean, yeah. it's a bit like a rhododendron. It's flamboyant in flower all at the top. There's these wonderful old crooked stems below, which I think lend character. Yeah. 
Well, with your current nursery, we can see little bits and bobs over the shoulder <laughs> and we yeah. can hear the bird song. It's absolutely yeah, it's glorious. Yeah. Um, you might that's, have the that's, best... That's, it's pre-recorded. It's, um... <laughs> <laughs> you might have the best soundscape to any guest in 83 episodes of Talking Dirty. <laughs> um, but what was the sort of the pivotal moment that helped you set up or kind of led you to set up Abby and Tom's Garden um, Arts? Well, I'd say it's quite a nice story, actually. I met Abby 20 years ago and when and when I did the initial meet the parents weekend I came up here because at the time I wasn't living living around here and uh, Abby's dad said I know let's take Tom to Hailcat it's this slightly unusual um, falling apart nursery you can go and have a look at it and uh, and we did you know we came here and as I say that was 20 years ago and it was in a pretty sorry state then. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, you know, you sort of semi-clock these places. I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm forever fascinated by it. I've, I've got this real thing about old walled gardens, particularly dilapidated walled gardens, because all you can see is the potential quite often. And it was the same here at Hailcat, really. Um, fast forward six or seven years, and, and in the meantime, um, Abby and I had always sort of we'd had an annual trip here during the summer just to see what was happening and progressively it got worse and worse and worse the plant collection was disappearing beneath birch trees and you know just the, it was it was a real it was it was just a quite a weird situation because we didn't know what was happening with it um going fast forward a little bit further on and i i was working in another garden with uh, a contractor who lived in the village here and we were talking over lunchtime and he said, oh, you know, you, you'll know Hailcat. Well, my friend Matthew, um, he's been renting it for the last couple of years. He's moving on. Um, and I said, oh, really? That's interesting. And you sort of, again, you sort of, um, pon- you know, keep quiet about that and you think it over. And um, my parents-in-law have a, a lovely garden themselves, which is not too far away from here. And they have a small nursery where they, their, their thing is auriculas and, and primulas. Uh, and other woodlandy plants and because they have a nursery um, they were sent a complimentary copy of horticulture week which for those of you who don't you know watching this not aware of this magazine it's a fairly dry publication <laughs> but it's a good place where you'd look for jobs and industry news etc and also they they talk about properties which are for rent businesses anyway my father-in-law spotted a very small box in there that said Hailcat nursery uh lease available with a phone number he phoned us up and we'd only been here a few months before and had driven away saying what you know it, it's so far gone now you don't know what to do you don't know where you'd start you kind of you know you'd be an idiot to take it on kind of thing and then he told us this and we leapt to the phone <laughs> <laughs> um and then from that point we had to come and make our case of what we wanted to do with the site because it was in such a state the people who own the estates really viewed it as a problem. And I think if, if, uh, if there hadn't been some sort of big idea about what to do with it, they probably would have bulldozed it or something or just, you know, put it to one side, left it fallow. Um, and we said, we really, really want to do this, um, but we need to shut it down for two years to start from scratch because there was, you know, there was nothing here. Um, there was the infrastructure was gone. There was no plant collection. We needed, you know, we needed ways to grow the plants. Nick, our landlord, said, "Well, that's an interesting idea. Not what I was quite expecting, because there was someone else who was proposing that they were going to take it on straight away." So actually, we drove away from the meeting feeling quite flat because we thought, "Well, actually, if we're going to do this, we need to try and do it properly." Um, anyway, kept us waiting for a week and then just sent us a, a little one line email saying, okay, let's go for it. And um, so that was our voyage into the unknown. At that stage, you know, we, we didn't have children. We had a lot of time on our hands so we could spend every weekend up here in the first year, just knocking it apart really. Um, and trying to, to um, get our heads around how it would work. Um, we made loads of mistakes, lots and lots of mistakes, hugely naive about a lot of what we were doing. Um, but but fundamentally, the the main aim of everything was to was to was to grow plants, and and to grow good plants that would that would 
thrive up here. Um, and that was it, really. So we, we, we set off with no business plan. <laughs> um, we had very, very limited resources to do it, um, which were completely exhausted by the time we, we, we crawled over the finish line to say, right, we're open. Um, and that was in 2011. Um, the first few years were um, pretty slow. There's a lot to build up. You know, if you take an exhausted site, an exhausted business, um, you've, you've got to you've got to really persuade people to come back to you. Um, I think I think Tom, that probably takes about five years by word of mouth. You're you're spot on. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly what yeah. someone said. <laughs> no, it's so true. Yeah, because um, it's amazing you said that because um, the very first weekend we opened. Um, uh, it was brilliant. Everyone in the village came and they were so supportive. It was like a little, fe- you know, it felt like a little festival. Then the reality of Monday kicked in and we had like <laughs> three, three cars drove up throughout the whole day. But one of them, um, this guy got out and he uh, he was walking around and he took me to one side and he said, um, I've been in business all my life. And he said, um, I didn't know what he did, but he said, I'm really admiring what you're both doing. And he, and he said, I've got two bits of advice for you. So the first thing was exactly what you just said, Alan. He said, mm. give it five years. If you can just stick at it for five years, you'll notice, you know, a bit of a step change. And he was so right. And the second thing he said was, um, because we're very much a seasonal business here, he said, treat every spring that you open as if it's your first. So I yeah. don't sit on your laurels and just expect people will come. Um, probably the two best bits of advice we had in the early yeah. days. And um, yeah. And, and it's obviously progressed amazingly well, you know, hard going to begin with, but then just gradually making loads of great progress. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's moved at a pace I think that we can, that we can uh, just about cope with. <laughs> um, and obviously, you know, the, the girls being around, that adds a whole dimension, you know, and as I said, you know, we, we are a small setup here. It was about, um, it was about three and a half members of staff. <laughs> Um, I'm feeling eight. sorry for the half member. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All we could afford. <laughs> um, uh, but it's 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 not easy because um, if you because we we made the conscious decision right at the start to be, I suppose you could argue quite purist about it. We would we only wanted to do the plants, and so many people said in the early days, you know, you're not going to survive without a shop. You're not going to survive without a cat. No, no, etc. Et yeah. Um, and we thought, well, surely it must be possible. It must be possible because everyone, you know, we, sadly, there's not that many nurseries around here anymore. I mean, if even the, the short time we've been here, they some have come and gone. But those who have gone down the route of, you know, um, doing that, putting in a shop, putting in a cafe, you, you, they fundamentally change and you end up being chained to the cafe or the retail, you know. Uh, and the plants invariably, you know, don't become the thing anymore. So um, I think that, you know, that, again, it's taken time. We've had to sort of weather that in a way. Um, but I think it's coming, it's coming round to the point where people, so, you know, like there's two, two really nice compliments you get when people come here, which is, um, I think that the one that really makes us feel good is when people say it's like walking around someone's garden, which is great. And the second thing is they say, please don't change it. <laughs> stick, you know, stick to what you're doing kind of thing. So well, I think the other thing is that people have customers in particular, they have enormous respect for people that actually are nurserymen that grow. Yeah. Because there's so many um, places today, they don't grow their own things. I mean, they, they just grab a bit from Holland and a bit from here and a bit from there and yeah. all the rest of it. And in come the Dutch trolleys and that's it, you know. But when you actually grow the stuff yourself, I think people do appreciate that. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, quite, and quite often, I mean, over this weekend, we've had, you know, which is great, lots of new people. Um, and quite a few of them will ask, how much do you grow? Which is a perfectly legitimate question. And I say, well, it's well over 95 percent of what you see. Yeah. And they're like, That's really? Unusual, yeah. Yeah, you know, so yeah. Yeah, a lot of places, it's often the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and um, and people. Yeah. As I say, people, people are clocking that now and I think a bit yeah. more I think I think uh, are more aware of this um, and it's quite interesting that 10 years we've been here when we first started 
at the time, you know, there was a lot of talk about encouraging wild, and still is, rightly so, about, you know, um, wildlife in the garden, wildlife-friendly mm. plants, and a lot of the questions were about that. Slightly less, uh, less questions on that subject, and it's shifted probably a bit more towards, you know, are you peat-free, which is good, which we are. But then it's kind of shifted even more so into the fact that these are produced on site, the plants you see. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how people gauge what you do. Or... I suppose the other thing is that they can actually see. Yeah. If they're looking around your nursery and garden, they can actually see the plants growing for themselves. Yeah. They know when they pick up this pot, this two litre pot or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something that is what it will be. Yeah. And um, you mentioned lots of plants that you grow. Yeah. We, of course, the heart and soul of Talking Dirty is to <laughs> clap eyes on some of those plants and get excited about them. But what have you brought along to start off some show and tell, Tom? Oh, well, I mean, something I've, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of is a, I'm, I'm doing the classic thing. I'm talking about plants we don't really sell. <laughs> I, I do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a crap businessman. I don't know. <laughs> um, a few years ago, I got to go to Ireland and... Um, uh, and, <laughs> and I got to visit some gardens and um, uh, I went to, I was very lucky to see around Kilmacurra Gardens there and the head gardener there, Seamus O'Brien, and we were talking about various plants and he introduced me to um, Cordyline Indivisor, which is <gasps> stunning, absolutely stunning thing. And he gave me some seed and he said, take this away, you know, and, and give this a shot. And so this was... Uh, five years ago uh, and so I'm, I'm just delighted I've managed not to kill it yet um, <laughs> but it's 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 the sort of plant you really need to see as a 20 25 year old specimen it's it's extraordinary people are very familiar with cordyline australis that you know you know much much tougher this cordyline indivisor has this incredible pretty hard to make out really um orange banding to the leaves um and my friend, Glyn, who's uh, another gardener, he said, they're great. You'll grow about 12 and one will survive. So far, out of 10, <laughs> five have died. I've still got the remaining five here, though. Um, I'm just. Oh, can I just say something? Because uncanny. I did that, this with the five years. You did this with Cordyline Indivisor. I have just planted that plant in my really? garden. And out of the 10 that I was given, one has survived. <laughs> This is weird. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, and it look it looks really healthy at the moment. I planted it in shade, which I hope is, is where it's yeah, going to survive. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just not uh, <laughs> I'm not quite brave enough yet to plant um, the thing out yet. I'm going to have to at some point though because they, they yeah. do look quite big. I mean, this is you know it's fairly sizable. Um, yeah. But uh, I'm just uh, I mean when you see it at Kilmacurra. The garden there it's it's an it's amazing microclimate and they don't really get frost and the only place where i'm i think i get away with growing this particular one is in the corner of our other site that we've got in grange over sands which is quite close to the sea yeah uh, it does get frost there but there's a couple of corners of the site which is which is much much smaller than we have here um where i think it would be far happier than here because we're in a bit of a frost pocket here and um but yeah it won't good. like <laughs> it really won't like so <laughs> um i think i think uh it's, it's it's been extremely happy in the greenhouse over the winter time but it's 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 quite cool in there it doesn't get you know it's it's a sort of a semi-glazed greenhouse so it doesn't get too too stuffy um but uh, I'm just thrilled that they've worked <laughs> and and also i know that you know it's great when they get to be more mature but it is lovely to be able to grow them from seed and hopefully oh, yeah, yeah. more than one will survive and you'll yeah, have them for yeah. 20 odd years and you'll be able to look at them and know that you grew it right from the very start yeah and, and and i think it takes you back you know to i mean the the whole reason i think so many of us get hooked in gardening in the first place is just it's i I'll, I'll never cease from the joy of getting that seedling and watching it develop into this incredible structure that when it initially appears it just looks like a blade of grass and then but then develops this, you know, this extraordinary structure. So, um, yeah, watch this space on on this particular plant. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a good strong start. I think um, you're also, as, as Alan pointed out, not alone. I'm fairly certain Jimmy Blake has talked about having a lot of trouble with keeping Indivisor alive. So clearly, this is just a plant uh, yeah. that likes to test us all, and, and we all want it all the more because of it. 
Yeah, it's funny you should mention him because <laughs> it's a, this is um, this is another plant which is probably about, it looks extraordinarily boring um, on the screen. Um, but this is a uh, a viburnum that I actually saw in his garden on part of the same trip, um, and it's viburnum um, betulifolium. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> you're not just planted it, have you? <laughs> 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 I have actually because, <laughs> because the said Jimmy when he was on that podcast with us he said you need to plant them in groups to get masses of these wonderful wonderful big shiny red berries yeah, yeah. And, I, and I had a single one and I thought this is no good come on we've got to get some more <laughs> you need more yeah okay, I'll, send you, I'll send you some I'll send you some <laughs> um, but again this is just another one of those uh, instances where you know the, the, those initial seedlings, which don't look much, take a. They do take a while. You know, most shrubs, a lot of shrubs do take. It's a slow burn with them. Yeah. Um, but it's finally this year. It's starting to look actually like a, a reasonable plant. I think that's you just touched on something there. I'd like to mention, and that is the fact that when you have a a real nurseryman like yourself and you're growing plants from seed, I mean that. I don't know how that is. How old that is? Probably four, maybe five years. Five years. Yeah. Yeah. Five years. Yeah. Well, that is a long time to nurture a plant. Yeah. to charge very little for. So oh, you, absolutely, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think, th yeah, again, I think that's um, quite often when people, I mean, not so much, because we we grow, I mean, our, our bread and butter is the herbaceous perennials. That's what we grow here. Um, and so, like, the production cycle for a herbaceous perennial is, you know, typically about two years from mm. seed to, to a plant that you can sell. If, if someone is contemplating buying something else that's much you know, and they see the price on it, and there's a, a deep intake of breath. Yeah. And so, well, you're looking at perhaps, you know, some instances, six, seven years worth of growing there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I'm, I, I can't wait to see that produce fruits one day <laughs> because, um, and it was one of the best things was uh, it looked like I did it with my my uh, our, our eldest daughter who at the time was four. Um, it looked like something of a horror show because the, the the fruit is so red, <laughs> and you have to smash it all up to get the seeds out. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about seeing that that grow, and yeah. I'll, I'll send you some on. Thank you. <laughs> well, you can come again, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm talking about a plant I don't sell, and I'm sending stock away. At no cost. <laughs> <laughs> the year we went bust. <laughs> hey. Oh, I heard something. I'm just trying to get a good signal here. Well, don't worry. If you can hear me properly, um, Alan, for some reason, isn't receiving any of the Zoom invites, so he can't join at the moment anyway. Oh, there's Mr. I can see the top of your head, Alan. Hi. If you, if you twist... <laughs> you... Yeah, there we go. Marvellous. Very technical, this. Now we can see your face. Um, are you happy to have like a couple of bits of plants to talk about or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Um, can I just go and grab a couple? Yeah, Is absolutely. They, they were in the greenhouse. I thought that. That's why I thought Bear I'd say it me. now. <laughs> don't, don't be surprised if you hear voices in the background saying, could you tell me where the toilet is, please? Or, <laughs> you know, or, uh... You might not know, but we have a great blooper section at the end of this podcast, so that it could be great then. <laughs> <laughs> that would fit really well. Might even well... get a, compl a complaint or something. <laughs>